Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, David Tello and I work at Philips Software Center of Excellence. Today I'm here to talk about InnoSource at scale and how we at Philips, we learn some of the um, uh, process uh, through doing InnoSource and how learning fast some of the lessons learned, you can improve your journey uh, down the road. So let me begin. So back in uh, February 2018, I joined Philips and of course I knew Philips as a, a consumer brand. It was all the way around. It was very popular for the lighting business or consumer domestic appliances. What uh, I didn't realize at that time is that the company was doing a huge transformation. So we were moving from a consumer manufacturer into a global medical innovator and provider. So as an example, an anecdote back uh, a few weeks after I joined, I could see how all the lighting business that was the inception of the company more than 130 years ago was divested and part of a new company that was renamed as uh, Signify. That was shocking for me, but then I realized more and more how many or how much uh, cool technology was on the healthcare space. And I could realize that there, when I visited the hospital, for example, or the doctor, that they could see patient monitors, MRI machines, uh, focus imaged guide therapy to minimize uh, in, uh, radiation. A lot of cool technology was available in healthcare. So the company was really performing a huge transformation. And my role at Philly Software Center of Excellence was helping the company uh, to do that because software was more and more important. And we were moving from an enabler of a system selling into a centric value of the value propositions. So if I fast forward three and a half years, and I go to a couple of weeks ago, I'm very proud to say that uh, uh, GitHub uh, announced that uh, the solutions, one of the open source projects that we put together in the company, it was endorsed as an auto scaling solution for uh, GitHub Actions. So it was really nice to see how something that we grew up internally, we worked with the teams internally, eventually it turned up into an open source project that was really receiving a lot of traction and contributions from other companies. And even GitHub in their official documentation was recommended. For me, it was a shock between uh, when I joined and only three and a half years ago, being all of a sudden part of uh, GitHub documentation. I think that's a, a nice example on how the company is really moving uh, fast on this software environment and becoming more and more open, which is indeed why I'm talking here today. Let me move on. So back in uh, 2016, we started uh, some of the first initiative uh, around inner source in the company. We had a fragmented environment. I don't think this is strange to some other big companies. We have teams working under different set of uh, environment tools ways of working, and it was really difficult for them to get together. So there was a clear problem statement about how we can make people to work together and start reinventing the wheel all the time. This first in the source approach was catalog based. So in essence, we were thinking, how can we create an abstraction layer where we make people to connect together? So if you're working in the different system for a different team, you could work and uh, talk to people using a different uh, um, technology. For example, you have here some of the examples that we have as the different technologies uh, for source code management, for example. So that was uh, taking some time. We take a lot of learns. And uh, one of the things that we realized is that, was that really in a source? So probably it was in a source to some extent because we created ad hoc collaboration opportunities. So we could have, for example, a team A working under um, source code with uh, GitHub, GitLabs, for example, and using uh, pipelines for the same provider. And they could talk to another team that was using, for example, Azure tool suite. They were using TF, uh, TF version control. They were using maybe Azure pipelines. So we could put them together. So in that catalog, those uh, repositories were visible and were accessible. But one of the things that we didn't expect it was that we that that was really a high friction environment. So even if you had the opportunity for those two teams to know each other, there were a lot of hurdles still to overcome. For example, permissions. So it was very useful that all the permissions were granted locally for those particular systems. So if I am from team A, I won't have access directly to the TFS based system of pro, uh, project B. And that created a lot of uh, um, unproductivity, for example. So you could have to request permissions, so you get uh, maybe an unpredictable, 
unpredictable lead time, and eventually you may have some sort of collaboration. But if you're trying to commit source code from your own system into the other one, it was impossible, virtually impossible, because they were really using different technologies. So that created pushback, and in reality, that didn't scale really well. So we had issues, we had some opportunities that we created ad hoc collaboration, but it was not really something maybe high or good enough to scale at the high, at the, at the whole of the company. So we took some of those uh, learnings and one of the biggest ones that we cannot just add in a source to existing processes, tools, and culture. So unless you can change your processes, tools, and culture uh, along the road, it will be very difficult to scale in a source. You may have some um, you know, quick wins, but uh, it will really be difficult to scale. That is what I'm talking today. In the second initiative or the evolution of our first uh, uh, catalog based uh, inner source, we made a more structural approach. We covered from uh, infrastructure, ways of working, migration and community. So we needed a modern self service infrastructure. We need a fully inner source based uh, principles, ways of working. We had to support really hand by hand some of the existing teams that they were having uh, issues on the migration from the existing legacy system into the new source environment. And of course, last but not least, in our North Star vision for source, we wanted to create a true community of practitioners. We wanted people to get together, to create value, and to move in one of the areas that the company has a, a high vision, is like become enterprise mindset. So to really go to provide solutions to our customers and patients, regardless of our existing, for example, uh, organization. Uh, so that was really important as part of the goals that we have for, for InnoSource. In the coming uh, slides, I'm going to provide you examples on uh, all, all those four things and what the kind of things we did that helped us. And in all cases, we were trying to get what we learned on our um, previous or first InnoSource approach and uh, evolved and improved for our second one. So let me go one by one. From infrastructure point of view, we made uh, significant changes. Uh, uh, a couple of the changes that uh, I would like to share with you is uh, one regarding the registration, so how you could join the uh, inner source community. So in the past, it used to be registration based. So there was a central team, they got requests, and uh, you know they were having a bit of a, a approval process. and many times requesting approvals from other teams so it created this high friction or a high lead time uh, response in the new approach we have a fully self-service registration uh, mechanism so you can either self-register or even more importantly you can invite others and this is working really nice so we have some automated workflow which allows any uh, inner source practitioner to invite to invite a colleague in philips and uh, there is an automated workflow that you can invite people and automatically they, they get access. We are getting about 80% or more of our new members in the inner source community through this invitation, automated invitation mechanism. That's working really nice and helping us to scale quickly. One of the examples that uh, maybe can bring to your mind is that you are two colleagues from two different departments uh, working together. You want to share something with the other person that repository is on inner source. Maybe the second person is still not yet there. So you can quickly go there, run self-service workflow, invite the people, and don't break the flow. So the second individual immediately can get access to the repository and maybe learn what you are trying to explain. The second example I wanted to share on the infrastructure is about our um, build runners. So one of the key services that we are providing to the inner source community to grow is the ability to hook their repositories uh, to um, self-hosted runners that they can be used to run your workflows. This is, uh, as I was introducing at the beginning, endorsed by GitHub, and it's the way to create an scalable on-demand uh, cloud-based infrastructure. So in the graph that you have below, thanks to the high observability that we have for the service, we realized, for example, that by end of September, we were running out of runners. So the growth of the community was so popular that uh, many times the um, on-demand ephemeral infrastructure was, was busy. So we decided uh, that we could increase that max capacity. As you can see from there beyond, we have even more usage of our infrastructure. As I said, this is again self-service. So when you create a repository, you can hook directly this service. So you don't need to get approvals or you don't need to get 
uh, anything uh, from outside the self-service registration that you do, and you get a, a scalable ephemeral infrastructure to run your workflows. This is becoming instrumental in the way that the people are seeing value add as well in our growing community of inner source. Let me go to the second example, ways of working. In this particular case, we have a strong support from our management. So we wanted to make inner sources a true default. So we are going from a, an environment where closed source was default, so you collaborate within your project, and we are making it inner source as default. And that inner source as default was a big change. So we had to also help people to provide guidelines to give them also opportunities. Of course, Philips is also working on innovation that maybe at the beginning they need some level of access restrictions. So you could have opportunities to protect your intellectual property. So how do we do that with the developers? So we are helping them by providing a set of questions that they can use to decide what is the right sharing level for them. Right now we have four sharing levels. You can have inner source as default. You can have, of course, open source when meaningful. You can have closed source. So in other words, restricting access when it makes sense from a confidentiality or other restrictions point of view. And you have also hybrid mode where it's also helpful in some times that we call it restricted source where a given repository is findable, but it's not, uh, the source code is not fully visible. How do we do this in a, in a real example? So recently we were migrating some of our teams from the legacy system into a source platform. At the beginning, they were assuming that they were going to take the inertia and make everything closed uh, for accessible for the different project that, uh, that was working on that particular repository. We, then we asked a couple of questions. So why do you really have some intellectual property that you cannot really share with the rest of Philip's colleagues? And after a couple of these questions, they realized by themselves that there was no reason why they couldn't create this as an inner source asset in our community. So they did that. So right now we gain an opportunity that all those repositories that were migrated from another system into the inner source uh, community, they were accessible for the rest of the community. And that's a big value proposition that we are driving. So unless you have a reason why not, you should be inner source. And that's a great support that we got from our management. Let me go to the third one, migration. As I said, uh, we are a big company, big enterprise, many systems, uh, and we have to do a lot of support to existing teams on how they can migrate and go into inner source ways of working on platform. In this case, I want to share with you two of the tools that are working really nicely with us uh, in order to go scale. First one is uh, um, what we call a unified, unified source code inventory. We have a dashboard where we are uh, getting together the different sources of systems that we have as for source code management in the company. Of course, including one of them being in a source, but we also are connecting the rest of legacy systems where maybe most of the code is closed. Why is this valuable? This is valuable because then you can both track and influence what is the progress. You can get an idea if you are really becoming more open over time or you are maybe you don't know. And that's a that's a big question. Eh? So uh, this is one of the areas that from the very beginning in Philips, we believed it was important. And we created one of the inner source commons patterns that uh, uh, has been contributed to the community and I will mention later. Second part that is complementing really nicely this inventory um, tool is what we call continuous compliance. There is an, um, a script which is running in the whole inner source community and ensuring sanity checks for the different repositories that you have over there. Those sanity checks can be things like, uh, do you have a readme? Do you have a contributing guidelines? Or they can even be more tailored to Philips needs. Do you have the required metadata that maybe uh, we want to use to make things findable in this uh, big ecosystem of inner source? Those, uh, that script is running continuously and filing directly issues into the code telling you, please add a readme or please add this particular metadata from Philips. This is helping to create a scale of growth and we don't have to have like an army of evangelists following up all those repositories and telling, hey, you should create a readme. So that's one of the areas where we are thinking uh, uh, that is successful and growing. And for example, we could use it uh, to ensure that more and more things are in place to ensure that the, the quality of inner source experience is, is really good. 
So let me go to the last theme, community. As I said, community was uh, one of our North Stars. We would like to become more of a sober community of practitioners in the company. And in this case, one of the things I want to share as an example is uh, awareness. So as part of the Philips Software Center of Excellence, we arrange and we host uh, Philips level um, uh, software conferences where we get together and talk about things like code quality or uh, DevOps or you know modern technologies. And last uh, June we had one uh, our last uh, software excellence conference, and one of the tracks was around open collaboration and inner source. And we have a great sessions with uh, um, keynote speaker. And uh, by the way, I have to thank uh, um, Georg Ruter, Vice President of Innersource Commons. He had the opportunity to join. He made an excellent participation on the keynote as keynote speaker and panelist and created a lot of awareness of uh, what good principles and, and the value of inner source are. But one of the things that we also did in that conference is arrange hands-on workshops. And those hands-on workshops were mostly in two flavors. One flavor was called my first inner source repository that resulted extremely successful. So we went all the way from creating a repo, uh, getting access to the community, creating a repository, adding your first content, hooking at a, a workflow, for example, adding a code quality gate. So it was a step-by-step -step process where we helped a lot of engineers to do the first steps. As you can see from that uh, June 2021, we have a, a huge uh, uh, jump on our number of uh, uh, Philips Inner Source uh, members. So this is the graph evolution. And it was so successful that one month later, we had to repeat the workshop and we have to, we had like a 300 plus a new people joining that particular workshop because it was a very low friction way to start here. We also have another workshop more advanced for practitioners uh, working on a, um, um, a modern automation and workflow automation and a CICD a pipeline technology and that have less people, but they, they really got a lot of value. So my recommendation is that really these events to create awareness helps a lot to growth and to, to drive scale in a, in a big uh, corporate. So one of the things on, I, I was thinking while preparing this um, presentation was what is the value proposition? And, and I think value proposition for, the, for us as a company has been evolving over time. So we started with a clear problem statement that was you know, why are we repeating the same things uh, in the different teams? I and mean, probably that's common in, uh, in other companies as well. But uh, so our, our initial value proposition was let's remove, let's, let's encourage reuse. And over time, you realize that reuse is not uh, just, but a, con a nice consequence of something which is bigger, which is having an open knowledge of a connected network of individuals of your company. So if you have a low friction channel where people can get together and share knowledge, then as a consequence, they get reused and many other things. And uh, if, indeed, if you think uh, reuse of source code is a kind of a backup solution. So you should encourage reuse uh, as a higher level, like uh, you reuse your service, you reuse APIs, you, you reuse uh, binaries artifacts. So that's, that's the point where you want to go. If I can share one of the uh, more, most inspiring experiences in our company, one particular team working on a medical software control uh, device that is uh, used in hospitals. They have about maybe 70 engineers. They were moving from a closed environment with a big monolith of uh, working software developed over uh, multiple years. And they really embraced the inner source from the very beginning, both from a platform, culture, and ways of working point of view. So the way that they did it, is that they started to create some slices from that monolith and created microservices on the new inner source environment. And in those microservices, they were getting a lot of benefits, like for example, higher automation. They have uh, multiple templates created so they can easily create repositories following all the rules and quality gates that they want. They, of course, they use the self-hosted runners infrastructure so they could get like a, a on-demand um, cloud uh, um, uh, machines to support whatever they need for my workflow automation that saved also significant amount of money uh, versus an on-prem based 
approach that they had before. And they had a, a strong community of practitioners. So it was so successful over time that that team is not anymore a product line. So they used to work for that particular product. So right now they became a platform enabler. So they are now part of an ecosystem where they are supplying these kind of services and source code to other teams across the company so they can use for their own products. So that was a really nice example on how you can reuse, how you can change your culture, ways of working under a low friction platform to create some of the value propositions for InnoSource. That was really inspiring example that we are sharing across the company because of course, we want to see more of those. So how, I, I don't think we could have done all of the, these things that we've been doing over the last uh, 18 months or so without some of the um, um, resources available in the inner source commons organization. It was really nice from the very beginning to see that there were off the shelf available training, both written and video uh, that we could use to learn some of the principles, also to educate some of our community because uh, in our experience as one of the things that we have to spend more and more energy and that goes to all levels. You have to go developers, you have to go middle management, you have to go you, all your stakeholders and you have to go also to the senior leadership. So that was really helpful. As I said, we contributed with our own uh, uniform, uh, unified source code inventory pattern, but we have much more on our pipeline. So we have been leveraging and contributing to the portal pattern, for example. We are also thinking how we can share what we are doing from a sharing level and a maturity journey point of view. So we can share that as a pattern with a, a community to explain how you can treat the inner source journey in your company as an evolution uh, or evolution, evolutionary journey that you can help teams in different levels of maturity. And uh, for example, one of the patterns that we also are have in our mind that is uh, based on what we are doing internally is also an inner source assessment pattern. So if you get resources from your inner source community, how you can ensure that the uh, consumer and contribution experience for those assets is excellent. So you can really create a continuous improvement uh, mechanism in your um, uh, system. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for spending the time watching this uh, presentation and uh, thanks you, thank you and have a nice uh, rest of the day. Bye bye.